Hello, and a very warm welcome to this film showing paintings by the Newland School artists from the collection of Penn Lee House Gallery and Museum in Penzance, Cornwall. Penzance is a lovely old town on the south coast of Cornwall's Penwith Peninsula. The train line from London actually finishes here, but if you'd like to go even further west, you can take the ferry over to the Isles of Scilly. The area's spectacular scenery, with its granite cliffs and sparkling seas, has attracted visiting artists since the early 19th century. In the 1880s, numerous British painters began to arrive in the fishing port of Newlyn, just a mile and a half west of Penzance, many of whom had trained in Paris or Antwerp. Most had also spent time painting in Brittany. In Newlyn, they found a similar source of inspiration, but closer to home and with a direct rail link to London. Like Brittany, Newlyn offered scenes and lives which appeared scarcely touched by the Industrial Revolution, with plentiful cheap accommodation and willing models. Soon a host of artists settled, forming the colony known as the Newlyn School. We have 24 images of paintings in our film, covering childhood, fishing, and everyday life. The vast majority of the works are oil on canvas. We'll point out the exceptions on screen as we go. There's no rush at all. Pause the film whenever you'd like, have a chat with your friends, and then when you are ready, just press play again. This film show is just a very small part of the collections of Penn Lee House Gallery and Museum. If you'd like to see more of their paintings and museum collection, just head over to their website anytime at www.penleehouse.org.uk. Starting with childhood. This looks a fine sunny day for the morning climb up the hill to Paul Board School in Newlyn, which now houses the Newlyn School of Art, by the artist Stanhope Alexander Forbes. We see groups of children on the move from all the way back down the hill, together with others stopping to chat with their friends. We've even got two heavy horses hauling their load towards us, haven't we? What was your walk to school like? Up a steep hill like this? Now, here's the thing. Is it better to have the uphill on the way to school in the morning when you've just woken up or in the evening on the way home when you're weary? Answers on a postcard, please. <laughs> Did you actually walk to school? Maybe picking up pals along the way? When I was at school... I used to take buses and trains at different times. Always worried I'd missed them, mind. This is a lovely painting of a young lady and a girl in a cottage by the window during lesson time. Despite the young lady's obviously smiling face, the girl looks a bit concerned, doesn't she? Maybe she's been asked a particularly thorny subtraction sum or her least favourite times table, or perhaps to do a recitation. Funnily, children these days always assume that the chalkboard in the lady's hand is an iPad. Did you have any lessons at home, or were they always in school? You might have had struggles with your writing like me. It always seemed easier, didn't it, using a pencil, and then we progressed onto the dratted dip pens or fountain pens. I don't know about you, but I had inky fingers and blots on my pages for years after that, not helped by being left-handed. 
We've got a very busy schoolroom here at the end of the day in this wonderfully detailed painting by Elizabeth Forbes. The artist often painted children and young people as she had in France before she came to Cornwall. I love the soft light shining through the window, don't you? Which picks up the children's rosy cheeks. There's a big age range here and the pupils seem to be mostly girls, don't they? We've got a little chap who's in a bit of bother in the bottom left on the bench there who is being teased by his older red-haired sisters in front of him. We believe his name is Richard Vivian Spargo, and apparently his family sent in a certificate to the museum some years ago showing that he had actually passed his schooling, proving he was not always a naughty boy. Were they mixed age groups that you were in, or was everyone roughly the same age when you were in class? I wonder if you went to a small or large school, in a village, town or city. No uniform here, but a wide array of aprons, bonnets and berets. Did you have a school uniform? What was it like? Here we have a lovely country scene with three girls sitting in a field in the summer sunshine, with the older one telling a fairy story while the younger girls listen on. Did you make up stories when you were young? Maybe even having imaginary adventures you'd go on. I wonder what featured. Dragons? Pirates? Or perhaps even dinosaurs? Or maybe just the odd rescued prince or princess, perhaps? The technique and detail are somewhat different in this painting compared to the previous one, aren't they? It's in lovely, soft, pale pastel colours, suggesting a lazy, hazy summer day. We've got three young chaps hanging out, as it were, with their model boat down by the harbour, I assume. Do you suppose their fathers are fishermen, and are they waiting for the boats to come back? Did you ever live near a harbour, and did your world revolve around it? Were you swimming off the quay or perhaps going crabbing? Of course, you may not have lived near the coast at all, but grew up in the country or a town. Do tell your friends where you would spend your free days with your pals when you were young. Do you remember meeting up with your buddies in your youth, whether it was boys or girls or a mixture of the two? I wonder if you had special places where you'd go to chat, perhaps in makeshift dens or even tree houses. At what age were you allowed to go off with your friends and what were the rules about playing out and when you'd need to come home? In this lovely clear painting, we have two children in earnest conversation with the girl, Laura, casually resting her foot against the skirting board behind and her slightly chastened-looking little brother listening on. In fact, Laura recalled getting extremely tired and uncomfortable standing on one leg there whilst posing for the painting. I think we may be having a lesson in how to be kind to a goldfish, perhaps. What do you think? Part of me wonders if he's been stirring the goldfish bowl with his Italian flag. The significance of the flag was probably due to Italy entering World War I that same year as the painting, on the side of the Allies. Can you also see the self-portrait of the artist Harold Harvey in the fine-looking mirror there? Did you have any siblings? And where were you in the family order? Maybe you were the eldest and it was expected that you'd take responsibility for the younger ones, no matter how irritating they might be. My mother and her 18-month older sister were always furious if they had to trail their little brother around, 
who was nine years younger than my mother. They even walked him along the beach one day, hand in hand, and dropped him into a deep, sandy pool. Beastly girls. Poor little chap. Here we have an oil painting of a girl indoors, delicately arranging primroses in the small wicker basket on her lap. It is on the occasion of Primrose Day, which marked the anniversary of the death of the British statesman and Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli on the 19th of April 1881, so titled because primroses were famously his favourite flower. Queen Victoria used to send bunches of them to him from Windsor Castle and Osborne House on occasion. The Primrose League was formed in 1883 to continue the legacy of Disraeli by spreading and popularising traditional conservative ideals, including the British monarchy, the British Empire, the Anglican Church and free enterprise. It grew in popularity from there until after World War I when it had declined. It was formally wound up in 2004. Somebody's engrossed in that magazine, aren't they? We have a girl sitting on a window seat inside a cottage, reading a magazine with a contented expression. Painting people inside a cottage next to a window was a frequent technique used by the Newlyn School artists so that they could explore the play of light on the scene. The paintings often included a prop or two, in our case here, the geraniums, the bottle and the key on the hook. In reality, I'm sure we'd have sat near the window too, to make the best of the light shining through the small-paned window into the often low-ceilinged rooms, particularly useful in the fading evening light to save on lamps or candles. Do you think the girl had chores to do and has nipped off to have a look at the magazines? Did magazines feature in your young life? Were they just grown-ups ones? Or were there ones specifically for children as well? Was it a big treat for you to have your weekly magazine? Perhaps it was delivered, or maybe you went to the shop to pick it up. There's that special moment, isn't there? A sort of magic when you opened it for the first time, crisp and new. How about children's comics? Were they a thing in your life? Like the Beano, the Dandy or the Eagle? Again, we have that special focus on light, as we mentioned before, in this painting by the Austrian artist Marianne Stokes. By this juncture, she was regularly exhibiting at the Royal Academy in London, children being her favourite subject, and she would often depict them hard at work, not necessarily doing heavy or manual labour, but fine, intensive work. Here we have a little boy helping out by polishing the glasses at the St Ives Arts Club, where the artist was a member. I wonder, did you have anything like this when you were small? Something you did just to help out, whether it was in the local shop or wherever? Did you do it because it was lovely to be involved or maybe get a little bit of money or some food? I used to ask to wash up at a beach cafe in Falmouth, owned by our neighbours, and I needed to stand on a box because I was so small. I loved it. Now on to fishing. Here we've got four chaps sitting in the hold of a fishing boat, perhaps out at sea, possibly waiting for the catch. The game they're playing is a trick-taking card game called Cutthroat Euchre, which originated in Alsace and was brought to the UK by the French prisoners of the Napoleonic Wars around 1810. 
Interestingly, the game was responsible for bringing the Joker into the modern deck of cards. This painting was displayed at the Royal Academy the same year it was painted, in 1909. Would playing cards be something that you would do when there was a break at work? What other pursuits would you follow in the downtime, or wasn't there such a thing and you were continuously working? Was a lunch break something that you could rely on? Would you stay in work or go out? And if you did, where would you go? This painting shows the community involvement that unfolded when the pilchard season was in full swing in Cornwall in the 19th century. The season was very short, stretching from late summer to autumn, when the pilchards would arrive in shoals around the Cornish coast. The man in the back centre of the painting is the hewer. He would shout, Hever, hever, meaning, here they are, or shoaling. He has a horn in his right hand, which he would use to alert the townsfolk that the pilchard shoal had been seen in the bay, whereupon the villagers would run down to the harbour to help the fishermen land the catch. The bush in his left hand was one of a pair, which he would use to direct the fishing boats offshore using semaphore signals to let them know where the fish shoal was. The shoal could be seen from the cliff tops as a stain on the surface of the water, but from sea level itself, the fish were very difficult to spot. The bushes were often covered in white cloth, and the man would wear a white jacket, so both could be seen easily by the fleet standing as he did on top of the cliff or even on the roof of a hewer's hut, like the one in Newquay. His hand signals would direct the sane boats carrying the heavy, fine meshed net to row in a big arc, paying out the net to surround the fish show. This is where the fish have been encircled by the sane net and gradually drawn more into the shallows. A tuck net will have also been laid by three or four boats to surround the fish more closely, and as that net is pulled in, the fish are drawn up to the surface. As we see in our painting, it looks almost as if the surface is boiling with the little fish, and men are scooping them into the many tuck boats around the borders of the net. The purpose of this style of keeping the fish in the tuck net until they were right near the shore was to keep them alive and fresh until the last possible moment. You can see how many fishermen were involved in landing the catch. Have you ever been involved with community activities where people locally would come together, such as bringing in a crop? picking hops or apples, or in Cornwall's case, trigging for cockles on the Helford River and St Anthony on Good Friday. Perhaps you've helped organise community celebrations. Here we have another painting by the Penzance-born artist Harold Harvey, who spent most of his life in the Penzance Newlyn area. He married Gertrude Bedinar from Newlyn, who was a model for the artists and later engaged in painting herself. He often painted scenes of working class, Cornish fishermen, farmers, miners and Cornish landscapes. This is a quite different kind of fishing from our previous image, isn't it? Whiting are bigger than pilchards, weighing about one kilogram and they are often caught between two and six miles offshore. We can see the long line over the side of the boat there, can't we? Did you ever go fishing? Maybe you were taught by a relative. Perhaps you went out on a boat if you went on a seaside holiday. 
Did you have good sea legs in a boat? Or would that flip-flopping make you queasy? In 1881, Birmingham-born Walter Langley received a commission from a wealthy patron to spend the next year in Newlyn, documenting the lives of the fishing community. Having come from a poor working-class background himself, he was particularly affected by the hardship endured by the fisher folk, and his paintings reflected that. Walter Langley was known as the pioneer of the Newlyn School, and he was the first of the Newlyn School artists to permanently settle in the village. We can certainly see hardship here, can't we? We've got these older fishwives hauling the heavy baskets of fish, known as calls, walking for miles until the contents of their baskets were all sold, selling in the marketplace and door to door. Each basket contained approximately 300 pilchards, weighing 84 pounds or 38 kilograms. Fishwives and their daughters also helped to clean and salt the fish. Were you ever involved in heavy work in your time? Did you gradually build up to it, or were you carrying heavy loads as a young person? In this very detailed interior painting by Ralph Todd, we see a woman taking a break from her work with the fishing nets. Fishing nets went through three stages, breeding, barking and beating. Breeding is the process of creating a long mesh by knotting a fine thread, often cotton, and as is the case in our picture, adding cork floats and maybe lead weights. At this stage, the net is relatively pale. Often the nets were handmade in long sheds, suspended by hooks at either end. In order to preserve the nets from the disintegrating effect of being constantly in salt water and the resulting damage and decay, the nets were regularly barked, which involved soaking them in a preservative. This was originally made from an extract of the bark of native oak or birch trees, but later imported in blocks of kutch the extract from the trunks of Far Eastern trees. The final process, often necessary, was beating the nets, which involved checking them for holes and tears and mending them, which is what the woman is doing here. We now move on to everyday life. We've got this young lady trimming her hat for Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee celebrations in Newlyn. What's drawn my attention is the little lad sitting next to her in his smart outfit. Did you or your family make your clothes for you? This little chap's got his smart suit with his breeches and jacket. Were your handmade garments super comfy? Or were they constricting, oversized, or perhaps even itchy? Did you have to keep them for best? I wonder if you were given a new outfit for annual occasions. Maybe Sunday school outings or Christmas, perhaps. I remember a lovely man I met some years ago who said his granny made him suits for school and they were dreadfully itchy. He just wished she wouldn't, but money was tight and he couldn't say, I don't want it, but they were always so scratchy. This is an interesting art technique that Elizabeth Forbes has used. It's called dry point. It's created by scratching a sharp point into metal and the resulting design is inked and a paper laid on top and the two are then squeezed through a printing press. The effect is lovely. The edges of the scratches are slightly feathery, giving a soft outline. 
Here we have a young woman rolling out the pastry for pasty making. She's got quite an audience there, hasn't she? At least four people watching her. Did anybody actually teach you to cook? Or did you mostly pick it up by watching? Or perhaps you were just dropped in at the deep end when you left home and it was sink or swim or get extremely hungry. I wonder if the men in your family cooked at all and did they have special dishes they would do? Most importantly, can you make a pasty? I'd better own up here. I've lived in Cornwall nearly all my life, even born here, and I've never made a pasty. I think I was scarred for life after my father made some when I was a child and the pastry was burnt and the meat inside raw. What a fabulous painting we have here. Funnily enough, when the painting first came into the possession of Penzance Town Council, they decided not to have it on show as they thought tourists would be deterred from coming to visit by seeing Penzance in the rain. Today, the painting is probably the most popular work in Penley House's collection, and prints of it have been spotted all over the world. Isn't it clever that where one would normally have a lot of action in the centre of the painting, in this case, we have mostly watery promenade? When you were younger, did your family decide that fresh air was best always, no matter the conditions? And would you be sent out or taken out? Were you reluctant or would you be happy to be out in all conditions? The more puddles, the better. Are the people in the painting soaked through, do you think? Did you have good clothing for keeping the wet out? Here's a young woman, she's shelling peas and she's obviously having a little daydream. Do you remember having chores? Did you race to get through them so that you could escape or did they just keep coming all day long? She certainly is having a little dream. Do you think she wishes she was somewhere else? How did you feel about your chores? Did you get your head down and get on with them? Or was it more difficult to motivate yourself? Did everyone in the family have their own jobs to do, perhaps? The girl has an interesting bonnet on her head, known as a gook, which provided excellent shade from the sun when working outside. This painting makes me quite dreamy just looking at it, does it you? The artist Fred Hall has created the wonderful soft furry effect of the donkey's coat by using a square-ended brush rather than a pointed one when applying the paint. When you were younger, perhaps when you were working, did you sneak a little snooze and did you ever get caught? I wonder, what's the recipe for good shut-eye? A cosy blanket, a sunny spot or maybe even a boring book? Tell your friends about your best catnaps. I love this painting of the pub landlady being chatted to, or is that chatted at, by one of her customers up at the bar in this oil painting by Dodd Proctor in 1935. Fabulous detail like the pewter tankards hanging above and the open newspaper and the empty beer glass on the table. Apparently, the landlady commissioned the painting herself. Do you think she looks happy in her work? Perhaps she's dreading having to change the barrels down in the cellar. I wonder, how have pubs fitted into your life? Did you have a local? Would you go regularly? And what was the atmosphere like? Was there a snug? Maybe there was a lounge bar and a public bar. Which one would you go into? Did you play cards, dominoes, cribbage, or maybe you're a dab hand at darts? We've got a wonderfully busy market scene here on a fine sunny day 
with the traders on the right-hand side and with people waiting and chatting by their ponies and traps on the left. I think those carts are known locally as jingles. Am I right? Was a weekly market part of your routine? And what would you particularly shop for there? Was it a social event? And I wonder how you got there and back. The bus? Walk? A car? Or perhaps even a pony and cart as in our painting? Here we have an etched copy of an original painting by Stanhope Forbes called Christmas Eve. It's an extremely well executed copy and the magazine extract stuck to the back of the frame praises Murray on his rendition of this work by Forbes. This Christmas Eve looks fun, doesn't it? Here we've got a band who almost seem to be giving an individual performance to the family watching in the doorway there. I wonder what's in that cart at the back of the picture? Do you suppose they're giving something out or selling something? I don't know what it would be. Were there community celebrations which took place in your town on Christmas Eve? Do tell your friends about the events you would go to during the Christmas season. This is the end of our film. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed making it. Remember to check the video notes below this film for access to our museum website www.penleyhouse.org.uk and our YouTube channel. You'll also find the Hereth link to access more wonderful films in this similar style.